All right, good morning. I would like to welcome everyone here today. My name is Rafael Salamanca. I am the council member for the 17th Council District, of which I serve as a chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to welcome my colleagues who are members of the committee and who are joining us today. I would like to um, welcome Council Member Kuhl, Lansman, Gredenchik, Chair Adams, and Council Member Diaz. I want to thank Council Member Moya, Kalos, and Adams for their leadership and work in, with the zonings, landmarks, and planning subcommittees. This hearing is going to be held jointly with Technology Committee, and I welcome Chair Ku and members of the committee who will be joining later on when we do our oversight over the Department of in Information Technology and, te and Telecommunications. This hearing will cover the fiscal 2019 pre preliminary budget for the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the Department of City Planning, and do it. Chair Ku will speak to some of the issues regarding do it at 11.30 a.m. I want to remind everyone that if you would like to testify, please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant of Arms. We're going to begin this hearing with testimony from the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and the Landmarks Subcommittee is chaired by, uh, by Chair Adrian Adams. I want to thank Chair Adams for her work on these issues. The Landmark Preservation Commission designates, regulates, and protects New York City's art historic and cultural resources. LPC's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget totals 6.7 million. The department's fiscal 2019 prelim preliminary budget is 456,000, or nearly 7.5% more than the fiscal 2018 adopted budget of 6.3 million. We would like to thank Chair Srinivasan, I'm sorry if I messed that up, <laughs> for, the, for joining us today. Before we hear from the chair, I would uh, turn over to Councilmember Adams for her opening remarks. Good morning. My name is Adrian Adams, and uh, first, I would like to thank Chair Salamanca and the members of the committee for holding this hearing today. Today, we will hear from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to discuss the agency's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget, which totals $6.7 million. As such, we will review LPC's budgetary actions included in the pre preliminary plan, as well as any current or proposed modifications to agency operations. LPC is entrusted with the responsibility to preserve our collective history in New York City through the landmark designation process. Landmark designation is an honor that the city imparts to exemplary buildings that capture a unique moment in the history of our city. However, the landmark process can be controversial. Property owners of designated landmarks face uncertainty about future costs for maintaining landmark buildings. They ask, how much will this landmark status cost for upkeep of their property? and what resources are available to them to help pay for that maintenance. LPC has also proposed several new rules which introduce more uncertainty into the landmark designation process, who is responsible for determining alterations to buildings, and how will these decisions be determined. The landmark process can also be controversial by the stories that these landmarks tell about our city whose story is being told through our landmark designations, and who decides what story should be told by our landmarks. Today's hearing is about transparency, and we hope the public will have answers to some of these questions before we're finished here today. Thank you, Chair Srinivasan, for being here today to answer our questions. I will hand it over to you now to read your testimony. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Salamanca and Chair Adams and members of the Land Use Committee. I'm Meenakshi Srinivasan, Chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Carroll, our Executive Director, Gardia Gaphard, our Budget Director, and Ali Razul Nijad, our Director of Community and uh, Intergovernmental Affairs. The Landmarks Commission, which is the mayoral agency responsible for protecting and preserving New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites, has been at the forefront of preservation policy and a model for many municipalities all over the country. The preservation of historic resources provides enormous public benefits and contributes to the vitality of the city and is in part what makes New York a dynamic global destination. I'm excited to be here before a new Land Use Committee, and thank you for inviting me to testify about the Commission and its fiscal year 2019 budget. 
I'd like to start by outlining the preliminary budget and then give you an overview of our achievements over the last term and highlight some of our new initiatives. The LPC's adopted budget for fiscal year 2018 was 6.26 million, and for fiscal year 2019, the preliminary budget is 6.74 million, which comprises 6.15 million in city funds and 596,000 in federal community development block grant funds. Of the overall preliminary budget, 87% is allocated to personnel services, and 13% is allocated to other than personnel services. Our budget supports agency departments, including the research department, responsible for evaluating and advancing properties for designation, the preservation department that reviews permit applications for work on designated properties, the enforcement department that investigates complaints of potential violations and helps owners correct non-compliances, and the archaeology and environmental review departments that assist city, state, and federal agencies for their environmental review process. The agency's total headcount of the preliminary fiscal year 2019 budget is 85, including 77 full-time positions and eight part-time positions. This is an increase of four full-time positions above the current headcount of 81, which includes 73 full-time positions and eight part-time positions. There are currently a total of 77 staff members, including 71 full-time and six part-time positions. We're in the process now of filling the remaining positions. The increase in our budget of uh, 456,000 includes funding for four new full-time positions, as well as provides us 240,000 in one-time funding for the agency's relocation from the municipal building at 1 Center Street to 253 Broadway. Of the CDBG funding, about 80% is allocated to personnel supporting critical community development related functions such as surveys, environmental review, archaeology, community outreach, and education, while about 20% or approximately 115,000 is allocated for our historic preservation grant program for low-income homeowners and not-for-profit organizations. The LPC designated and regulates more than 36,000 buildings in all five boroughs including 1,408 individual landmarks, 120 interior landmarks, 10 scenic landmarks, and 141 historic districts and extensions. We also receive close to 14,000 applications annually for work on these designated properties. Under my tenure, the Commission has taken a multi-pronged approach to ensure good government practices and to promote equity, diversity, efficiency, and transparency in all aspects of our work. I am proud that from 2014 to 2018, with the help of our research department, the Commission extended landmark status to 3,861 buildings and sites across the five boroughs, including 63 individual landmarks, two interior landmarks, and 10 historic districts. This is the second highest total for an administration in its first term since 1974. The majority of these properties are within historic districts, extending protections to 3,771 buildings and sites that reflect New York's diverse neighborhoods. These include the Central Ridgewood, Crown Heights North, Bedford Historic Districts, and the Mount Morris Park Historic District Extension. We're also pleased that the agency has no backlog for calendars properties for designation. We commenced a highly public 18-month process in 2015 to address items that had been on the Commission's calendar for decades some since 1966. This initiative led to the designation of 26 stellar buildings and structures by the end of 2016 and the IRT powerhouse in 2017. These designations represent all five boroughs and celebrate a diverse array of architectural styles, time periods, building typologies, and historical significance. Throughout the last four years, we have also worked closely with the Department of City Planning to evaluate historic preservation opportunities in neighborhoods undergoing rezoning or neighborhood plans. As a result, we designated 12 buildings in East Midtown and the Empire Dairy Complex, which includes five buildings in East New York. The Commission is also considering designations in East, Har uh, uh, in East Harlem. We have four properties under consideration. Uh, and in the past week, we also calendared two properties in the Far Rockaways. Both these neighborhoods have been recently rezoned. We're currently working with city planning to evaluate historic resources in Gowanus, Bushwick, and Inwood. In 2017, 
Fiscal year 2017, we designated 26 individual landmarks, two interiors, and two historic districts for a total of 319 buildings and sites. Thus far, in fiscal year 2018, we have designated 11 individual landmarks and one interior landmark, including Old St. James Church in Elmhurst, the IRT Powerhouse on the west side of Manhattan, and the interiors of the New York Public Library at 42nd Street. We have also calendared nine additional buildings, one interior and two historic districts, including Boreham Hill Historic District Extension and Central Harlem, 130th to 132nd Street in Upper Manhattan. I'm excited to let you know that on March 20th, we will bring before the Commission our recommendation to calendar the Coney Island Boardwalk as a scenic landmark. I will now turn to our Preservation Department, which is the largest department within the agency and which helps owners of designated buildings to navigate the permit process to restore, alter, and rehabilitate their buildings. The staff issues approximately 94 to 97% of the permits administratively, pursuant to the Commission's rules and they present approximately 3 to 6% of the applications to the full commission each year. In fiscal year 2017, the commission received 13,874 permit applications and took action on 13,556 applications during the same period. Through February of this year, we received, um, in this fiscal year, we received 8,786 applications and have taken action on 79, 1,029 applications. The number of, uh, yeah, 7,929 applications, excuse me. The number of applications received last fiscal year reflects about 16.6% increase over the number of applications the LPs received in four years earlier in fiscal year 13. Our permit reviewer headcount has increased by 33% in the same period. This has allowed us to continue to issue permits efficiently and provide support for those seeking to make changes, whether they're large property owners, small business, or homeowners. In 2017, we also launched an internal tracking system that is time sensitive to make the review of applications much more accountable. In order to improve our regulatory functions even further, we have commenced the CAPA process, which is the City Wide Administrative Process Act for proposed amendments to our agency rules that will update standards and codify well-established commission policies and staff practices for ministerial staff level approvals. Over the past year, we have con conducted significant outreach to preservation advocates, property owners, and industry groups, and a public hearing will be scheduled for March 27th. We believe that these amendments will create a more streamlined process for permits, will make our regulatory procedures much more efficient and cost effective, and will provide more transparency for property owners, community residents, and others in your districts. The Commission also implements a modest historic preservation grant program targeted for low and moderate income homeowners and not-for-profit organizations to help restore or repair the facades of their landmark buildings. In fiscal year 2018, the program was award, has awarded three grants, one residential grant in the Prospect Park South Historic District in Brooklyn, and two non-for-profit grants, including the Rene and Haim Gross Foundation in South Village Historic District, and the Henry Street Settlement and Individual Landmark on the Lower East Side. We're also currently speaking with OMB and HUD to clarify the types of projects at religious properties that may qualify for a grant program, and thanks to the urging of Chair Salamanca. Over the past four years, we've had made gr great strides in harnessing technology and our website to achieve our goal to provide more transparency and accessibility to the Commission's work. Regarding our research and designation work, since 2014, all designation reports have been made available online. In 2016, we launched an interactive landmarks web map, Discover NYC Landmarks, that provides an intuitive and interactive tool to access information regarding our designations. Last year, we launched the Historic Building Data Project, in which we transferred information from 50 years of designation reports into a geographic information system database. In December 2017, we enhanced our landmarks web map with building-by-building -building data on all buildings within historic districts and searchable information on the approximately 36,000 buildings and sites under the Commission's purview. We believe that this readily available information is invaluable to property owners, community groups, residents and members of the public. On our regulatory side, since 2015, we have made all commission level application presentations and commission decisions available online. Since 2016, a searchable online permit application database 
has also been made available, allowing interested parties to view the status of LPC applications and issued permits, including staff level approvals. In 2016, the Commission also launched a digital archive dedicated to our robust archaeological collections, making New York City the first municipality to host such digital archives. And within the past year, we unveiled an interactive story map to celebrate the centennial of women's suffrage in New York, and we had previously in launched an interactive map on the LGBT historic designations. I will end by just saying how honored I am to lead this agency. It is a tremendous privilege to be trusted with the Commission's mandate to preserve New York's heritage for us and future generations. Thank you again for allowing me to testify, and I'm happy to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to recognize we've been joined by Chair Moya. Um, just for the panel, we've, we, uh, we would like to swear you in, so the council will, will swear you in. Okay. Please state your names. Meenakshi Srinivasan. Sarah Carroll. Guard Ye Kepart. <coughs> Ali Rasulinajad. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you will give today and the testimony you've just given will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will respond to all questions truthfully as well? I do. Yes, yes, I we do. do. We do. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. So I want to just uh, touch base a little bit in terms of your, your new rules and your proposed amendments. Um, can you speak a little bit about what they are very deep, well, not too detailed, but you know, point them out and how, how is that process going to work? I know that there is a, uh, a proposed uh, hearing that you're going to have on March 28th. Uh, they said, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, the 27th, uh, regarding these uh, proposed changes. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Uh, agencies adopt rules that um, codifies their policies and practices. It is uh, seen as a very transparent way of showing everyone what the commission does. We have an extensive body of rules uh, that essentially uh, explains what type of applications come before, uh, are, that are approved at staff level versus what comes before the commission. And uh, at this point, about 93 to 96% of the applications are approved at staff level. Uh, we've been working on this rules initiative uh, over the past several years to find ways to continue to streamline our process and to allow for the regulatory process to uh, meet up with current and future demands. Um, so the broader goals of this initiative is really one of efficiency, of transparency, uh, allowing uh, uh, owners of, and stakeholders to um, go through a process which is uh, more streamlined and predictable, uh, and really to encourage uh, compliance with the law. And we believe overall uh, the goals of uh, our rules would also foster preservation in the future as well, and I can explain that a little further. So broadly speaking, uh, the rules do three things. The first is that it reorganizes our extensive body of rules uh, to be much more um, readable and intuitive. Uh, right now you have sections that are in different parts uh, of the document and we're planning to consolidate them so that they are much more, uh, um, just much more comprehensive and understandable. So that's the first rule which is a structural change. The second is that for 50 years the staff has um, had the practice of approving uh, certain types of applications and we see this as an opportunity to codify those rules um, um, uh, as a part of this proposal. And we believe that the codification of rules that are for staff level approvals that are current will make it much more clear and much more consistent. And so we believe that that really will be much more transparent, both for staff but also for, uh, for stakeholders, including uh, property owners themselves. They'll understand what they need to do, um, as well as um, preservation groups, community residents, and members of the public. The third thing that uh, our rules would do is that they would codify uh, what we've seen as um, consistent commission practice to approve certain types of applications, and those would be codified and delegated to staff. And if can, you I'm think, sorry, can you repeat that yeah. again? What's going to be delegated to staff? What's going to be delegated to staff are the types of applications that have come before the commission over the past you know, several years, in fact, a fairly long period of time, where the commission has consistently 
approved and established criteria for that adoption. So, so staff will be approving designation without it going to the no, commission? The, the, this, these are related to applications that come after the designation has taken place. So the designation process hasn't changed. This is really, uh, the rule changes are really for applications that come before the commission and are approved either by staff or by the commission. So it's really, yeah, it, it's application based. And, but, uh, and the applicants are typically property owners who come before us. All right, um, um, so with this, uh, these changes of rules, I see that you're going to significantly increase the workload of your staff members. Uh, so do you believe that in fiscal year 19, you have the adequate amount of staffing there or are you planning on increasing your, your staffing? All right, I think of, you know, the number of applications we receive, which is roughly about 14,000, uh, and it'll increase yearly, roughly around 1.6% each year on an average, um, will remain the same. So with the rule changes, the number of applications we receive will be the same. What will change is the number of applications that go, that are uh, approved at staff will be greater and the number of applications uh, approved at the commission will be less. But one thing to note is our staff in our preservation department works on both sets of applications. So they work on the commission approvals as well. Uh, there's always an internal review to make sure that those applications are complete and then they bring it before the commission and they coordinate ongoing public hearings as well. So as a result of our change, uh, what will happen is that uh, since the, the uh, staff level approvals tend to be much more streamlined and uh, timely, it will actually reduce some of the uh, work that the staff will do. So uh, generally speaking, you have staff level approvals that take somewhere about a month to, uh, to approve, and you have commission level approvals which take about three to six months. Uh, so there's a time saving factor, but also just a uh, uh, a more streamlined process for staff level review as well. Right. Um, and I, yes, okay. okay. And so are there any measures that are being considered to ensure the transparency regarding how decisions are made through staff? So what happened was last year, we already um, created a database that's available uh, on our website and you can search that so you can actually find applications that are approved at staff level. You can find out, well, you can find out how many have been filed and you can also find out the status, whether it's under review and uh, then when it's approved as well. So that will be ongoing well. All right. I'm gonna hand it off to our Chair uh, Adams. She has more specific questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Chair. I had some questions regarding uh, the grants and uh, the way that the grants are handled. Um, according to data provided by your agency to the Council over the past three fiscal years, 10 historic preservation grants were awarded to both homeowners and nonprofit organizations. The total amount of funding at adoption for fiscal year 2016 through 2018 um, were substantial amounts. I just want to know who approves the applications for the grants? Uh, we have staff uh, that approves, the, uh, that works on the grants, and then we have a board within uh, the Land Rocks Commission who will finally award uh, the grants. So we have uh, people who are working on the application process, and then finally there's a board that will approve the grants. Okay, so a combination of the staff and then the board is the final? Yes. Final answer, okay. Um, we understand that grant applicants need to meet a number of criterion uh -huh. for yes. consideration. Uh, what is LPC doing? Um, or what is the amount of funding in your advertising budget to spread the word about the grant opportunity? All right, our grant is about $115,000 uh, annually, and um, there's several fronts. So we do a lot of outreach to encourage people to apply for the grant, uh, and our outreach includes during new designations, when we're, uh, we're, when we're talking to property owners and garnering support, we talk to them about the grant program. 
Uh, during the designation process, often we will go back out to communities and again explain what are, what are the responsibilities of landmarking and then what, is, uh, what are the various programs available for financial assistance, one being a grant program. Uh, and often once uh, historic districts are, particularly historic districts, when they're, um, when they're designated, we will go back to those communities. We also do targeted outreach. Um, I know that we did one in uh, Longwood uh, Historic District on the request of uh, Chair Salamanca, which we thought was very effective. And we've done several in Addisley Park, which was specific to really understanding the grant program. So the grant program comes from our CDBG funding, which has federal requirements to them. And they're basically for low and moderate income. Um, and they have other kinds of criteria associated with them. Uh, which is that the property must be owned by the person who is asking for the grant. Uh, in the case of a nonprofit, the nonprofit uh, should be a charitable organization, own the property, and the charitable organization, scientific, educational, or literary. Um, so that should be the bailiwick. Although I just want to point out we are exploring with HUD about um, the grants and its eligibility to religious properties as well. So that's an ongoing uh, piece of work that we're doing. Uh, the other criteria that we have includes looking at the building itself, um, the type of work, um, uh, whether it's restorative in nature, and, uh, and just the impact of the grant itself on both the existing building, the surrounding buildings if it's in a historic district, and the, uh, and, and the impact uh, within the historic district overall. Uh, so our grants are typically for restorative work, and they run the gamut. They, um, you know, you could do stoop repair, you could do repointing and, and uh, remodeling on the facades, uh, you could do uh, replacement um, and um, upgrading of windows uh, and repair of other historic features like cornices, sills, and lintels. Um, so those are the kind of things that uh, come before us. And um, I think those are the points I wanted to make. Okay, the, so the scope is very, very broad. Right. Um, and just one more thing, I think our grants roughly run between uh, you know, 10 to uh, $30,000 per grant. Uh, part of that is to uh, uh, sort of allow for, uh, uh, you know, spread, spread that, uh, those dollars to more people. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, I think, where we get the numbers, which is about four, four grants, three grants, and three grants over the last three years. That was my next question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also want to know how many applications uh, are submitted for historic preservation grants. Okay. Well, it's it's very sort of interesting. In the last uh, two years, we received twenty applications, out of which only seven were really eligible for the grant. Under HUD. Under HUD. Uh, under the criteria. So. Uh, the other were unfortunately did not qualify because either they didn't meet the, mostly because they did not meet the income levels that was required, or they didn't own the property. Um, so, and then over, let's say, the last uh, five years, we received about 60 applications, and 24 of them were um, eligible for the grant, and we granted about, uh, we granted 18 projects. And so over the last five years, we've dispensed about, you know, somewhere about $450,000 for various grants. Okay, and the average, uh, I think you just answered it, but the average uh, grant amount requested? Right, it's, uh, we usually give roughly ten to $30,000. Uh, in some years, we've given more than that. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, it was about uh, forty-nine, fifty thousand. 50000 uh, It varies, but it's th that's roughly, I would say, on an average. Okay. Um, I just have the, a couple more. Uh, with the understanding that each landmarks is unique, has LPC conducted any surveys of the cost of maintenance required to maintain good standing with LPC? Um, well, have you done surveys? I think what we've seen is uh, through our application process is that many people come to us. You know, when we think about the uh, 14,000 applications that, that come before the commission and the fact that about 63 to 60 7% is approved at staff level. Those are really applications that are for maintenance and restoration work. So I think that speaks to the fact that many homeowners are very, very interested in the upkeep of their property. 
we see actually a very small amount of properties that really let their buildings go into disrepair, and we have another process that deals with it. So, uh, you know, I, I think I can confidently say majority of property owners really keep their buildings in well, uh, you know, in, in good condition uh, under the landmarks law, and um, these there are these few and far between uh, situations, uh, and those we will. Uh, pursue another action to try and get uh, owners to keep up their properties. How they keep the property. Right, and uh, yeah, okay, so the other thing is just uh, in terms of uh, the cost of maintaining, and it's, it's sort of an interesting question. The first thing is that we don't compel property owners to do work. Uh, when you're designated, uh, you're not required to go and restore your building if, if you have grandfathered features. It's really when applicants want, and owners want to come before the commission and they have a scope of work in mind. Then we will work with them on a couple of fronts. So we have technical expertise to guide owners and uh, explain to them what kind of work they can do and what are the best techniques of getting that work implemented. Um, we are sensitive to the issues of cost, and while strictly not, you know, it's not strictly within the landmarks law, but I think as an agency, we recognize that uh, our stakeholders uh, have, you know, different incomes and different backgrounds, and we're flexible about the kind of materials that they use, and we will guide them towards that. You know, we continue to have conversations with the industry on, let's say, substitute materials and what's acceptable. And so we have a pretty good you know, knowledge base in being able to, um, to really uh, to advise uh, homeowners uh, on work that they want to do. And finally, we, uh, we will refer them to different financial sort of sources, of, um, including our own grant program, but there are others that are offered by other uh, non-for-profits, for example, uh, the New York um, Conservancy, so they, Landmarks Conservancy, they have several grants. They have grants for religious properties, which is separate, but they also have other grants for homeowners. Um, and it's a loan program. And then there are tax credits that are, are available both at uh, the federal and state level. And we encourage um, owners to seek that as well. Okay. Do you feel that you are exhausting um, your resources to help uh, property owners to minimize uncertainty around costs of future maintenance? Um, have we exhausted? You know, there's always uh, room for improvement. And I think that uh, one of the things we are thinking, I mean, the rules really is one sort of way of, of uh, furthering that, that overall goal of making the regulatory burdens much less are burdensome, so to speak. And I think, I just on the rules, because I know uh, Chair Salamanca is very interested in many of the commissioners, and so council members may be interested, is that the type of work that we're talking about, which would uh, be delegated or has already done its stuff and will be codified, is really everyday work that you see on properties everywhere. So if you think about those, uh, the type of work we're talking about allowing for, you know, storefronts to have windows that can open, that you have you know, limited signage and awnings. Uh, there's uh, features which have to do with code upgrades and sustainability and, and, and resiliency. Um, uh, there are other issues which is, even if it's for facade work, it's all restorative nature, but allowing for uh, different kinds of materials to essentially um, really meet the goal of preservation. So. Uh, the majority of the scope of uh, the rules is really about things that, uh, you know, in fact, sometimes we wonder why are these some things coming before the commission uh, when they're really very, you know, they're small in scope um, and we, you know, they're ubiquitous in nature and they haven't yet been codified as a rule and so this is our opportunity to do that. And so we think that that scope of, of work under our rules is really, um, very much um, uh, in the same vein as I think some of the, the issues that you raised about uh, the burdens for, um, for people who own designated properties. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, just one more. I had a question uh, regarding your, um, your MMR and uh, PMMR uh, information. We've got some uh, indicators that don't have, 
yeah. that don't have targets associated mm -hmm. with them. Can you explain that? Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn it to uh, my executive director, Sarah. Okay. Sarah Carroll. Okay. Um, I think we are we're happy to address specific ones if you have questions about them, but I think that ones that the indicators that um, calculate our performance are, in other words, our timeliness or responsiveness, those have targets. The ones that track the number of letters the agency receives or the number of emails the agency receives those because those are coming from the outside there's no target for the agency it's it's not necessarily a performance indicator okay i'm going to turn it back over to chair what with that thank you thank you uh chair adams can i just have more questions in terms of that um you're doing very well in terms of what your the MMRs that we're getting here in terms of your four month actuals? I mean, in fiscal year 18, for the last four months, letters responded within 14 days, 97 percent. Um, but I I feel that you should still have a target that you that you want to work out of, um, and I, that's actually one of my recommendations uh, for your agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, how many letters? And how many emails are you actually responding to? Because here it just says that you responded to 97% of them, but how, what's, what is 97%? I think, it was, I think we get like thousands of emails, and uh, I think we have those so, numbers, right? The number, the number yeah. of letters yeah. are fairly low. Okay, so the letters are different from the emails, yeah. and uh, so the so, number, let's see. So if you had um, 11 letters and we responded to 95, 11 letters and 11. we responded to 95% of them within 14 days, that would be, I'm turning to our budget director who can do math very quickly. <laughs> 11 letters, 95%. So 85 are responded within the 14 days, and 10 letters came afterwards. And how many emails? OK, I, yeah, I think I'm going to. OK. Could you put, uh, I think so, right, so for example, in um, And while you look for that information, you know, you're, we, this is one of the reasons that we're asking in terms of letters and emails, it's just good to know your workflow and the amount of workflow that you have. Uh, you know, one of the main purposes of your agency is to actually communicate with the community. Um, and tracking your communication, I think, is vital and key for us uh, when we're looking at staffing for your agency. Mm -hmm. So just um, for, Jan uh, for just this past January, the agency received 483 emails. Okay, 98% is a very high mark. I mean, that's uh, something you should be very proud of. I'm gonna, I know uh, Chair Moya has some questions. After Chair Moya, we'll go to Council Member Godenchik. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, and uh, thank you, Chairwoman, uh, for your time. I just have one quick question. Uh, on the old St. James, yes. um, is that, has that been done already? That's been designated, yes. Okay. That, that was my only question. I just, uh, also just want to know if we, ha we had support of the church. On, on yeah, no, no, that's because that's a it big... It has been. Right. It's, it, yes, it's, yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. So, yeah. you know, it's the second, I think, second oldest uh, ecclesiastic building in Queens. It's yeah, beautiful. correct. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, Council Gretentric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair. It's good to see you. I know we don't can see much of you, but uh, I'm all the way out in Eastern Queens. Um, my quick question: Once a property is designated a landmark, does it are there tax benefits that accrue to it? Property tax benefits, or sales tax benefits, or how does the city kind of compensate somebody? Right. There, are, there. My understanding: there's no tax benefits to it. Uh, it's only when you do work you can sort of seek. Um, tax credits through either the state or federal programs that are in place. Okay, um, okay. That, that was it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I, um, I have some questions. I know you may have 
answer them uh, with uh, Chair Adams. Um, it has to do with the, uh, the grants. How many within uh, fiscal year 16, 17, and 18, you were, uh, there were 10 grants that were awarded? How many applicants were there? So for Okay. So in total, there were uh, 30 applications over the last three years. How many? 30. Three zero. 30. Okay. And the ones that are eligible? Uh, the ones that are eligible is uh, three. And there were 10 that are eligible, yes. and we granted all 10 of them. And uh, one of them we granted, but they actually withdrew that application later on. So we had granted it to them, they withdrew the application. So, and are these applications like public facing, accessible to the public? Are they accessible to the public? Yes. Uh, God, you can't Yes, they are, our grant application uh, can be found on our website, um, on the Landmarks website, nyc.gov slash landmarks. We have both our nonprofit application and our uh, <coughs> homeowner application on our website. Yeah, so 30 applicants in, in three years. What was the criteria? Why were, this, why were some of these applicants turned down? Well, mostly it's because they didn't meet the income eligibility under the, the federal, under the HUD rules. Okay. And um, tell me a little bit about advertisement how, and outreach. How, how does your agency, you know, put this information out so that the city of New York or five boroughs knows that there's grants available for them? Right, so I think you know one thing we talked about uh, was the outreach that we do uh, to let either new owners of designated properties or uh, na people within uh, in neighborhoods who've owned their property for a long time is to uh, go out and actually make presentations to them. Sometimes I've gone, and sometimes you know obviously the team has gone. So we do sort of face-to-face -face outreach with owners of properties as well as new. Uh, owners that are uh, that may have their properties designated, and I think that's where I kind of noted that we've gone out to Addisley Park twice, and we've gone out to Longwood. Um, we also have information on our website that's available. That's what uh, Guardia was talking about. We have pamphlets which we distribute and we mail, uh, so people can get that. Uh, we do e-blasts as well, and um, and I think the the other way that we get our grant program known is that uh, you know the preservation community is very interested in uh, the use of grants whether it's our grants or from the state and city or other nonprofits that provide it because ultimately it's very good for preservation when buildings are able to uh, restore and upkeep uh, their buildings so very often uh, our sort of What's it? Orbit community uh, does a lot of referrals as well. So we refer our when applicants come to us, we refer them to other. Uh, we tell them about our grant, but we also tell them about other grants. And similarly, we get referrals from other um, organizations. For example, the uh, New York Landmark Conservancy will refer people back to us also about the grants. Now, this uh, these are grants. Th uh, the funding is coming from the federal government. Am I right? So yes. what happens when, in a fiscal year, you don't use all of the funding that that grant has? Where, where does that money go? Uh, well, one thing, you know, but if, if, the, if the funds for the grants that we have been awarded are not dispersed because there's a timing issue, which is we award the grant, they are, it's put out to bid, we project manage uh, these grants in the process, um, so if there's money that is, uh, was uh, sort of earmarked for these grants and are not done during a fiscal year, then we work with OMB and they will roll over the funds uh, to the next year so the work can, can be completed in the next year. So in 2016, you utilized $71,713. Uh, so, and, and you got a total of one hundred and fourteen thousand, correct? Right. So that that funding was rolled over. It'll roll over if it's awarded already to a grant. Right. And what if it's not so, awarded? So yes, there's sometimes situations where there'll be 
a certain amount that's kind of left on the table, so to speak, uh, and that will go into the general fund. Is that right? Yeah. It's just, it's so for, for, for funding that is not spent, I mean, unfortunately, that's money that's left on the table. Uh, unfortunately, that's money that we're not, able to, we're not able to use. So only funding that's been earmarked to particular projects we are able to roll over. So, so the, the funding that's not used just goes to the general fund? Just stays in, in the city, the federal fund, the general city uh, federal fund. It goes back to the federal government? City, C, yes, federal government, yeah. So the city, so, so it it's- goes back it, to the city, right? With the city, but it's the city CDBG funding. So the CDBG, uh, the federal CDBG funding is spread over several agencies, not only LPC. So that's a general part. For example, a couple of years ago, we also received uh, funding, additional funding to our CDBG program for an upgrade of one of our systems, our urgent system. So that was funding, that was extra funding we got in our budget that was taken from another part of the city's federal funding that wasn't spent. So that happens where if there's funding that LPC is not able to use, but there's another city, pro another city agency that has federal CDBG programs, that money can be spent on those, uh, on those agencies too if they request so, it. So, so Funding that's not used, so this hundred and fifteen thousand dollars that you get for grants. Yes. You know, you've only ten ten applicants in a matter of three years. So there's money that's being rolled over to the special fund, the separate fund that you have uh, for funding that you get from the federal government that you don't use. Am I following you there? So so within the one hundred and fifteen thousand, say we were able to award grants. Uh, for pro for projects that total a hundred thousand dollars, just as, as an example, so of those grants that total a hundred or hundred thousand dollars, the remaining fifteen thousand dollars, unfortunately, that's money that's left on the table that we're not able to spend. That's money that's available citywide. It's citywide CDBG program that another city agency could get it could get transferred to another city agency if they request it from OMB, but that's something that LPC has not been has not been able to spend. Now, of the $100,000 that LPC allocated to projects, if the projects are not completed within the fiscal year, the one for that $100,000, let's say half of it got completed for $50,000. The other $50,000, it was earmarked to these projects, but it weren't completed yet. That $50,000 gets rolled over to the next fiscal year. So those are the two different things in our budget. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to understand. Uh, so, if you use your example, that fifteen thousand dollars that was left over, it gets put onto this federal f uh, city fund that you have there. Now, do other agencies have access to that money? Uh, the, at other agencies have access to the general CDBG funding. Now, there are different criteria that's OMB OMB decides how that's how that is spent. But unfortunately, for that fifteen thousand that LPC could not spend, unfortunately, that's money that LPC left on the table, but it's federal funding that's available uh, to the city. All right, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna, I would like to inquire more on this in terms okay. of that funding, where the money goes, so we're gonna be sending you something uh, okay. to get more clarification sure. on that. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, go back to um, the new proposed rules. I have some questions here. Um, so in terms of your, um, on March 27th, your commission is gonna vote on these new proposed rules. So why should primary facades, which are typically front on public streets or otherwise have a significant design or architectural feature, be permitted to be altered via staff approval rather than approved from the commissioners? Uh, okay, so just to, uh, to clarify, uh, March 27th, we're having a public hearing, but the commission is not gonna be voting on that. So the process, we'll get comments, and typically we will we'll, uh, consolidate all those comments. We have, may have changes, um, we may have uh, responses to those, and that'll come back to the commission later on. Um, so the issue with the, uh, the building facades, which we agree they have um, important features, I think we just have to be uh, sort of clear that the staff level approvals are not going to change what it historically looks like. Those kind of changes would come before the commission. What the staff level approvals will do is just, it, first of all, the staff uh, approves, re it's it basically restoration work. So it means that you know re the, this is what the historic building facade is, and there's upkeep that's required, or you know the cornice is broken and you have to recreate it. Those kind of things can now be done at staff level, and overall. Restoration. Yeah. 
Okay. So, uh, rules are, yeah. And in fact, there are, when it comes to the front facade, the rules are, in fact, more restrictive. So, uh, you, I, you know, the scope of work uh, of our rules, which sort of says building facades, rears, you know, ramps, uh, I think uh, it's good to know that they all include criteria and sort of a, a, sort of a philosophy behind them. So the restoration rules uh, for the front facades is in fact very conservative. It's all about, in fact, preserving and protecting uh, the historic features. So it's, if there are changes that are being made to the front facade which deviate or depart from what it was historically, then that will come before the commission. So for example, if somebody is coming before and asking that they remove their cornice or they, they want to widen their windows, then those kind of changes will have to come before the commission. All right. I want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Gibson. Um, what types of rooftop additions and rear yard additions or enlargements will the staff be allowed to approve under this proposed rule? And how does this differ from the exi existing rule? Okay. So, in fact, uh, the current rules allow you to do rooftop, uh, rooftop additions uh, that are non-visible and uh, rear yard additions. Uh, so that's already allowed. The changes that we're proposing are very, they're actually very, very modest. And in terms of the rooftop additions, we're allowing for slightly, what we consider minimally visible uh, rooftop additions. And we're really talking about these additions that are visible either from very far away from the building or they're, you know, oblique angles uh, that, uh, that where the, the rooftop addition cannot even be associated with the building. And so uh, that's kind of the, the change that we're proposing over there. In terms of the rear yard, our rules are actually going to be uh, in some ways more restrictive because it's going to only allow for two stories and um, it's going to actually include design criteria or basically the staff will be able to sort of regulate uh, the material and the windows um, at, uh, in the, these rear yard additions uh, more than they can do right now. And so um, it's, I think the design criteria is a very big, uh, uh, I think a great improvement of our rules right now. And we're talking about really small additions. So I think that, you know, we know that um, this is an issue. People have talked about it to us. And I just want to sort of give the council some sort of reassurance that the type of applications which are larger, uh, which are more complex, will continue to come before the commission. And um, yeah, I think. So those will, the larger ones will go. So we'll come before the commission. That There's no change there. It's really for uh, the very minimally visible rooftop additions and two-story uh, rear yard additions where now we can actually do more than that. Um, and I just want to point out one other thing about the rules, which is we're talking about, especially the rear yard additions in what's considered the donuts, the area behind uh, where there's already at least 50% of, of, of the buildings already have these rear yard additions. So when you think about uh, the existing context, there's already an existing context which sort of supports the fact that you could, another person can come and have an addition. All right. So for rooftops and rear yard additions, the proposed rules define minimal visible as something that means certain measurable criteria, or does that not call attention to itself or distract from any significant uh, features and then provides a list of factors that staff must consider. Can you discuss these factors? Um, I'm sorry, can, someone, uh, can I ask you to repeat that again, yeah. please? I'm sorry. So for the rooftops yeah. and rear yards additions, yeah. the proposed rules defined, defines minimal visible yes. as something that meets certain measurable criteria or does not call attention to itself or distract from any significant features, and then provides a list of factors that staff must consider. Can you discuss these factors? Um, so In other words, why are you proposing to change the, defi the, the definition of minimal visible from the old definition? Uh, because what we have found is that this minimal, uh, minimally visible, which is really the, the change, 
has been routinely approved by the commission. I th every time it's come before the commission, it has been approved. So that is a, that's the sort of theory. So, behind so why should thinking. staff be making these decisions and not the and, and and not the commission and without public without it going through a public process? Because it's a, well, there there two sort of ideas here. One is that applications that come before the commission are worked first are reviewed by staff. So the staff already works with applicants to reduce visibility. And so it's only when they've, so it's in, in some ways, they've actually crafted the level of visibility. And so then when it comes before the commission, the commission approves it. It's, it's, it's become, uh, I think the staff understands what the commission is looking for and what but is- they're, they're not the commissioners. They're not, yeah. but they are essentially working on applications to bring them to a point which is considered- They're preparing applications for commissioners and commissioners should make that final determination. That's the point that I'm making here. You're empowering staff and you're, you're cutting a process and, and, and so you're just making the assumption that the commissioners are just gonna approve this. Um, but I feel that well, staff should not be making these right. decisions. The commissioners, mm -hmm. right. the commission should make this decision. Right. I think we're not talking about we're, we're making the assumption that commission commissioners will approve it. The commissioners do approve it, and the commissioners ap uh, approve it routinely and consistently. And, and, and the commissioners don't have questions when they come up and they bring these applications. So they, you're telling me they're just rubber stamping these applications? It's, I think it's because, yes, I think what Sarah was telling, it's because these, the visibility is so minimal, it's, it's, it's minor. It's in fact, for the same reasons that we, you know, just what I said before was that it's, you know, disconnected from, um, uh, you know, let's say it's, it's disassociated from the building. So we're talking about views that are very far off from the building itself. Um, they're usually in a situation where there are other rooftop uh, additions or buildings behind it. And uh, you cannot actually sort of, you can barely see it and it does not detract from the, you know, from either the historic district or the building where it's situated. So the, so the, the, the criteria is based on the standards that the commission already uses and the staff is very experienced in the commission's commissioner's standards that they apply because they routinely prepare these applications every month and they listen to the commissioners. And we're talking about the kind of visibility that's so minimal that you can't even tell what building it's on. It's through an, an eight foot alley looking into the back of other buildings against the backdrop of apartment buildings and you don't see which building the addition is on and you're only seeing two feet of it. So it's very incidental views that are, as the chair said, disassociated from the building itself and in the context of other additions and taller buildings. Anything that is more visible or um, noticeable would still be uh, reviewed and approved by the full commission. Um, my and next question, uh, and go ahead. Uh, Council Member, I just uh, wanted to just point out that, you know, the rules that um, we have proposed and a part of that process is the commission, our commission will have to approve those rules as well. So this is, you know, they're gonna be aware of this and so uh, they're, uh, they are kind of the integral part of the process. The, the commission has to adopt the rules. All right. How long does it usually take to obtain a certificate of appropriateness via the commission review for these types of changes that we just discussed? Uh, well, uh, typically I think uh, um, it's somewhere between, you know, six, three to six months. Three to six months, yeah. All right. And how long is it expected for approval to take uh, place if these determinations are delegated to staff? Uh, you know, if once the application is complete, uh, it's usually about 30 days, and uh, in some cases it's as a little as 20 days. Um, all right. And just, yeah, I think one other point I just want to make is because some of these changes are so minimal, it really, I, we see this as a, we do see it as a cost effective measure as well. And uh, it allows for more certainty in the process. 
the criteria is clear, so it's more transparent. And I, you know, the intent is really to uh, to uh, to lessen some of the burdens for property owners because we are talking about work which is done, you know, routinely. Has a uh, compromise been considered, such as LPC staff posting the proposal information on the website with an opportunity for the public to comment to the staff within a certain number of days of posting? Uh, well, right now what we're doing, you know, we've, we've done a lot of outreach. We know there are different comments that will come in. And uh, I think part of, uh, we're looking forward to having our public hearing uh, next week. But it does, that's where we're hoping to sort of hear comments and uh, and then you know we'll take that under consideration so right now we haven't but uh, you know we're waiting uh, the public process uh, and comments will help us uh, continue to refine the proposal right. would would uh, LPC support some type of public review of staff determinations I think we'll have to look at that uh, council member okay I want to recognize we've been joined by uh, council member Traeger um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Chair Adams for more questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had uh, one, uh, one more question. I keep saying one more question, but this really is one more question. Uh, you, you've had a move pending for a while. Do you know when you will be moving? Uh, we uh, have our public hearing on the 27th. Right. So, I'm sorry. The move. The move. I'm so sorry. I'm so focused on the rules. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, we believe that we sh by the end of this year, the work will be done. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be able to do it. Calendar. Okay. Calendar year. Yes. Calendar year. Okay. Yeah, the calendar thank you. Year. That was so my question. Uh, yeah. Late, uh, late fall, early uh, winter. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Traeger has some questions. Thank you, Chairs, um, and welcome. Uh, great to see, to, see you, great to see you, Chair. Uh, so I, I, f forgive me if I missed this uh, earlier. Uh, I'm hearing the news that we will have soon a calendared item of landmarking the boardwalk at LPC. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Unfortunately, you weren't here when we broke that good news. But uh, yes, we intend to bring this uh, before the commission on March 20th, and we're going to recommend that the commission calendar this property as a. Well, as I, I greatly appreciate that and, and the work of, of your of your staff as well, and I thank you for personally coming down with your team to Coney Island. Um, and so, just just for clarity, uh, so March 20th is the date that you'll recommend for it to be calendar. Calendared, is that correct? Yes. And just so um, I calm the concerns of, of my constituents. Uh, since some items that have been calendared or on the calendar have been backlogged for quite some time, folks in my community would like to be alive, including me, uh, for work. the day for this to happen. Can you yeah. just give us a time frame of uh, what that means? Uh, we think we can, you know, we, it's after we calendar, we could have a public hearing and we hope to try, and since, you know, obviously this is a uh, process, but we'd like to complete it either in spring or summer. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. I look forward to our continued partnership and making this a reality. But Chair, this is, this is a big, big, big news. Uh, working with uh, my colleague, Councilman Deutsch, and my office with LPC and many residents and stakeholders, we will finally see the legendary, iconic Coney Island Boardwalk become a landmark in New York City. And it happened without any lobbyists, no conservancies, a complete grassroots effort from the community. Thank you for your chairs. And so, Chair Salamanca, you, you were supportive of this in a resolution. I know Chair Adams, I appreciate your support a, as well. So thank you very much. Congrats, Council okay. Member Traeger. Thank you. Just want to recognize that we've been uh, joined by Council Member Deutsch. Um, I just have a f maybe one last question. Um, have there been conversations with your agency uh, in terms of there being some federal cuts to your funding? Um, well, as you know, the administration is ver working very hard to sort of stave off any kind of uh, federal funding cuts. And so uh, this past year, it has not impacted us at all. Uh, and we'll, you know, we understand, we don't know what will happen, but we, we know that the administration will continue to fight any cuts at the federal level that affect our agency. 
Um, and what is included in the community development funding budget? So uh, the community development funding budget is roughly about uh, $595,000. Uh, about 473000 is uh, for um, uh, uh, basically 10 staff um, positions, um, and those include five full-time and five part-time. Uh, they are for research and survey work. Uh, they are basically our, um, fund our environmental review, and they also fund uh, archaeology, um, our archaeology division, and, and uh, the grant program. So, so uh, well, let, let me just say, uh, 473,000 uh, is for um, the, these four issues. Then we have 115,000, which is for the grant. And then we have about 8,000, which is for, you know, it's administrative costs. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Um, is there any uh, testimony or questions from members of the public? Seeing none, thank you, Commissioner, and your team Pleasure. for test for your testimony today. We will now take a short recess. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Committee.
Diary.
There's a microphone check. Today's date is March 15, 2018. Hearing on land use vote being recorded by John Biondo. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, Rafael Salamanca, Chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to thank Chair Moya, Chair Adams, and Chair Kalos for their work on our, on our Land Use Committee subcommittees. Today we'll be voting to approve the Spofford Campus Redevelopment Application, also known as the Peninsula. These five related actions, LUs 31 to 35, will facilitate the redevelopment of the former Spofford Juvenile Detention Center into a five-building mixed-use project with approximately 740 units of 100% affordable housing and light industrial, commercial, and community facility uses in the Hunts Point neighborhood in my council district. Today we will be also be voting to approve LUs 39 and 40, two much needed primary schools in Councilmember Van Bremen's district in Queens. We'll be voting to disapprove LUs 21 and 22, individual landmark designations for single family homes in Councilmember Jonai's district in City Island in the Bronx. Councilmember Jonai disagrees with the assessment of the LPC in that he does not believe that the architectural and historical merits of these buildings warrant designation as compared to the burdens of landmark designations on single family homeowners. Prior to the subcommittee vote, the subcommittee and land use staff work with Councilmember Jonai's office to arrange additional conversions between the LPC and the owners of these two homes who are opposed to landmark designation. The committee is aware the, that LPC staff is often able to assure owners that designation is not a burdensome as it is perceived to be. LPC typically explains that it can provide valuable technical resources and refer owners to other resources, such as foundations providing financial assistance. Unfortunately, direct com conversations between LPC and these owners did not come to fruition in accordance with the recommendations of the subcommittee. We'll be voting to disapprove these items. Are there any questions or remarks from members of the subcommittee? No, well, I would like to very quickly just speak briefly on this project in my district, uh, the Spofford project. As many as you know, um, my district, the South Bronx, is home to, uh, we were home to three jails in my council district. And in 2011, uh, the ACS decided to close Spofford, which was a dark moment in our community's life for over 50 years, which was a juvenile detention center. I've been working on this project since 2013, and I want to give a shout out to city planning, uh, Charlie Samboy, and to Ismini Espiliotis for manning management. Uh, we've been working on this project since 2013, and to know that we've been able to take this piece of land and create 740 units of 100% affordable housing um, have a homeless set aside and ranging from 30% AMI to up to 90% AMI. To know that we were able to extend the um, affordability from 40 years to 60 years. Uh, to know that we were able to add what's called a food incubator to this project. So anyone that has a business in the community, whether they're building cakes or they're doing some type of uh, jars, uh, and they're doing this at home. They have a, uh, there's, there's space in, um, in this location, uh, 2,000 to about 2,500 square feet, where they can go and it's a startup business, startup space for their business. Uh, to know that there's, a, there's something called a peninsula. I was a peninsula uh, alumni when I was in pre-K, uh, in the community, has been there for over 50 years. Uh, and to know that they're gonna be able to build out their own space is very rewarding. Uh, to know that uh, this project will include labor. The laborers will be there to do the demolition. You know, there's been many conversations about affordable housing and is it really affordable to bring in labor? 
I've always begged to differ that there should be uh, uh, conversations and there should be negotiations in which labor can be part of these projects and labor is gonna be part of this project. So I'm really excited about that. There's also gonna be a training component where we're gonna take residents from the community and they're going to learn on-site job skills and get an opportunity to join into some of these um, labor organizations. There's gonna be open space where the rec center right behind, there's gonna be 14,000 new uh, green space that's gonna be added. And I got commitments from the, uh, from the developer that they will, they will redo the sidewalks on a 100-year-old monastery that's right next to this project. Um, I'm really excited about this project and I really urge my colleagues uh, to vote in favor of this. All right, and then last, we'll be voting to hold a public hearing later today on pre-considered LU application number 180239-PXX, submitted to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to 195 of the New York City Charter for a notice of intent to acquire office space for the Taxi and Limousine Commission in building located at 188 West 230th Street, Block 3264, Lot 104, Borough of the Bronx, Community Board 8, District 14. This item was not on landmark subcommittee regular calendar. Rules 11.30 of the council rules provides that in order for the subcommittee to hold a public hearing on a matter that's not included in our calendar, two-thirds of, two of the land use committee or subcommittee must vote to add the matter to the calendar for today's 115 subcommittee meeting. So with that, are there any uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? No, seeing none, I will now call a vote in accordance with recommendations of the subcommittees and with the support of the local members to approve LUs 31 through 35, 39, and 40 to this approve LUs 21 and 22 and to add pre-LU taxi and limousine office space to the landmark subcommittee calendar. We will be taking one vote on all the items together. A vote of, a, of, of yes is a vote to approve the Spofford Campus Redevelopment La Peninsula and the two schools and to disapprove the two landmarks and to add the office space application to the calendar. Will the clerk please call the roll? William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on land use. Chair Salamanca. Aye on all. Gibson. Congratulations, Chair Salamanca, on the Spofford Campus Redevelopment. It's a great addition to the South Bronx. Um, I'm happy at the end result, and you and your team worked tremendously hard, so congratulations. I vote aye on all. Konstantinidis. Aye on all. Deutsch. Uh, may I please explain my vote? So first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, our Chair uh, Salamanca and uh, and it was really great um, um, being uh, chairing the, the planning and dispositions and sessions, hearing uh, in replacement of uh, Ben Kalos, who was on paternity leave. And there's only one thing I'd like to add is that uh, I would love to see in the future on all new HPD projects and affordable housing uh, that should be set aside for veteran homeless. Um, so this is something that I'm gonna be pushing in the council and to see if we could do that. You have a little under 500 homeless veterans, so in no time could we take them out of homeless shelters and put in, putting them in into um, regular living space. So once again, I'd, I write I and all. Yes, Barry, I'll be quiet. Cool. I want to say uh, congratulations to our chair and then uh, vote yes. Lanceman. Aye. Miller. Permission to explain? Uh, I, I want to congratulate Chair Salamanca on the project in your district, and I, will, and, and I just want to add that to be able to provide affordable housing at that site with such a tainted legacy uh, on young men throughout this city for nearly a uh, half century is a really positive move in the right direction is what we see when, when, when council and others come together uh, to create positive impact. So uh, with that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Reynoso. I vote aye. Torres. 
I vote aye, and I want to congratulate um, Councilmember Salamanca for his, he's a first-rate negotiator, a credit to the Bronx and to the city, and, and it's a, a victory well-deserved. I vote aye. Traeger. Grenchik. Adams. Congratulations, Chair Salamanca. Any time we can see affordable housing coming up under a legacy that seemed to be so dark, we appreciate everything that you've done. That said, I do vote aye on all. Diaz. Chairman Sal Salamanca, as a Bronzai and a colleague from the Bronx, I want to cite you a, a passage from the Bible. It says, without a vision, the people will, will perish. And you have a vision. You have, you have shown that you have a great vision for, the, for your constituent. You have made us proud in the Bronx. And congratulate you. And the district has been lucky and fortunate to have a leader like you. I vote yes. Moya. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the chairman on uh, this uh, great victory for you, but uh, more importantly for the community. Uh, your negotiations uh, are really going to have a long-lasting impact uh, on the people uh, who live in your district, and uh, you should be very proud of uh, what you've accomplished here. Uh, I will be voting aye on all. Rivera. Congratulations. I know how hard you worked on this project, and I'm so proud of you. So I'm proud to be a part of this council. I vote aye on all. My vote of 15 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. All items have been adopted by the committee. All right, thank you. I would like to thank members of the public, my colleagues, council, and the land use staff for attending today's hearing. And particularly, I would like to thank and acknowledge Dylan Casey for his work as deputy counsel for this land use committee. Uh, Dylan's last day with the council is tomorrow. Please join me in wishing him the best uh, his, at his new job in California. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.